is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Black Flame, the third book in the Cradle series, chapters one, two, and three. In these chapters, I can't believe where I had to stop reading. It was really hard, you guys. It was really hard. I just want to keep reading so bad. The only thing that saved me was knowing that I get to record on this again tomorrow and follow up right away. But I am le concerned. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Andrew for commissioning this episode, for commissioning this whole series. Um, And we have, as of last week, scheduled the uh, book that is not yet out, which I shall be beginning in December, because November was all booked up already. So I'm pretty excited about that, too. And thank you for that, Andrew. I'm totally stoked. Um, (laughs) Yeah, this book. Okay, so we're going to start at the beginning, as one is wont to do. Chapter one, information requested, the path of black flame. Warning, significant deviations detected. Report accuracy compromised. Recommend renewed contact with iteration 110 to restore functionality. Beginning report. A word? This thing is just like, hey, uh, this could be very well be hugely inaccurate so we'll tell you what we know but like low key don't depend on it and you probably want to hook back up with the system and refresh just in case and that is fascinating to me i didn't know that the system was subject to those kinds of fluctuations and i just i just want to know i just want to know so we get a look at the black flame family and this i'm just gonna read this there there are some things you can summarize there are some things that it's like my summary is not going to have the same effect for over five centuries the black flame family held their empire by virtue of unstoppable force before facing a single black flame sacred artist an entire sect would surrender All across the empire's lands, rebel strongholds and rival schools were burned in dark fire. None stood against the black flames because none dared. To be suspected of insurrection was to be destroyed. The path of the unstained shield excels in protection. The path of a thousand hands in versatility. The path of the cloud hammer is respected for mobility and force. The path of silver grace for its elegance. Is that a bummer to anybody else? Silver Grace for its elegance. Really? Is that it? And honestly, I'm judging myself here because I I, I care so much about aesthetics that I might be part of that one if I was going to pick because that speaks to me, even though it seems so useless. Um. The many paths of the red flower family grow food and bring rain throughout the empire, and the path of jade eyes is unmatched in healing. The path of black flame was stolen from ancient dragons. It is the art of pure destruction. So basically, somehow, they stole this knowledge, they stole this art, and it essentially wound up killing them all because this shit is too much for a human body to handle. And they, their magic is, ate them from the inside out is what wound up happening. Um, more and more of the day-to-day workings of the empire were left to the Black Flame's traditional servants, the Nauru clan. They became the face of the Black Flame Empire with their loyal reputation and shining emerald wings, and the people grew to know and trust them. Fifty years ago, when the Black Flame family had faded to ashes and myths, the Nauru quietly ascended the throne. 
The first Nauru clan empress has has since moved into private seclusion, and her son now rules the empire. As for the Black Flame family themselves, most died out decades ago, gradually eaten from the inside by their own Madra. The only remaining Black Flames are data not found. Again, I say, a word? Uh, I'm interested. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like that's significant and something that I would like to know very much. If their family and their path are revived, the consequences could be connection severed, restoring connection, connection failure. Uh, oh, so this shit is serious. This is a lot. This is a big deal. The, the computer, I feel, got overloaded. It felt like that black flame power eating it from the inside. And I can't help but think... That power, that pure destruction, that sounds like some shit that would be right up Jai Long's alley. I don't, I don't love it. I feel like Jai Long, he's one of those people that he could just do so much better, but he has let himself get wrapped up in vengeance in this way that's like deeply understandable so I can't even be that upset at him for it, but I want more for him than that. And I will say these three chapters, I wound up giving way more of a shit about Crawl's death and Jai Long than I expected. I really like Jai Long immediately as a character. He's very fascinating. He has a really awesome backstory he is somebody who is simultaneously, he's got a little bit of Prince Zuko in him, but there's also, he isn't as foolish because it feels like he's really learned something. Uh, he has a chat with his sister and we find out like she's been wounded to a point that recovering from it may not happen. Um, and I don't think that I quite realized how bad it was. I think that he, I, I kind of thought that he would be able to bring her back to health eventually, but that his family saw her survival as too closely linked with his disgrace. And so they just sort of disowned her as a matter of course. I didn't realize that she remained weakened after that whole thing went down and Honestly, it's her survival and the way that they have been disowned. I feel like it makes so much more sense that he is this angry at his family when you take her into account. Um, if it were just him, it would still be understandable, but it would feel a lot more selfish and a lot more just about his pride. But when you put his sister into that equation, it is a lot. <laughs> it feels like he is enraged on her behalf, just as much as he is on his own, because we are told in no uncertain terms that the Jai family has what she needs to be healed fully. They just don't really see the point. She isn't going to be an asset to them. So why waste resources on her? In a lot of ways, she is in the position that Lyndon is in, except that she had the ability and it was taken away and Lyndon was simply born without it. But they're both treated like <sighs> they're both treated like leeches, you know? that they are just going to suck up valuable energy, valuable resources, and not really deliver anything back. And that is so deeply short-sighted. You just don't know what somebody's potential is. And I know I've talked about this at length, so I'm not going to get too far into it. But the, the number of people out there who have 
unrealized potential because they just don't have access to the resources that other folks have. It's just the sort of thing that when you really look at the disparate opportunities, depending on what walk of life you come from, it's enough to really make you so enraged. The other day I was actually, um, I was watching a Pawn Stars episode actually, and they were talking about the, some stuff from the Boy Scouts that somebody was trying to sell. And it got me thinking about, as a kid, how I had a few friends who were in the Brownies, which is sort of like uh, the Cub Scouts, but for girls. And the Brownies was one of those things that I always had a lot of curiosity about because it seemed like they did really cool stuff. They, you know, learned how to make things. They went on hikes and they did all these activities. And yet you had to pay a fee in order to be part of that organization. And it wasn't cheap and I could never be part of it. I was, you know, my family just didn't have that kind of money to spare. And I noticed that it was not like being part of the Brownies, that relationship that you had with other people who were also part of that group was not simply isolated to the meetings for the Brownies. Those girls developed these closer friendships that continued as they got older and they became close friends and oftentimes wound up like making connections because of organizations like this. And this is part of like the whole thing with Greek culture. When you go into college, you have to pay a fee in order to be part of a sorority or a fraternity. But the advantage is supposed to be that you have connections now to people who are going to potentially be in different positions in companies that you maybe want to work for or companies that are going to be doing business with a place that you work for already and that you are supposed to be able to draw on that relationship for more resources, for opportunities, getting some a phone number of somebody who can help you with XYZ, maybe getting a discount on this and that, maybe getting a phone call that you wouldn't otherwise have gotten. And it just made me think about how early that starts. You know, I was a child and I couldn't join the brownies. And I wonder how many people wind up with connections that they sort of take for granted with opportunities that they wouldn't have had had they not become friends with so-and-so whose parents work for this big company who was able to get them an internship at such and such. And the fact that it's often seen as, oh, well, they may, they like really did it for themselves, even though they were in a position to be given this opportunity simply based on who they know. It wasn't actually that they went on equal footing into an application pool with a bunch of other people with their name hidden from their application. They were given access to an opportunity that would absolutely never be given to someone that the people who make the choice don't know personally. And I have a couple of friends who work in banking and they see this all the time. These kids that get given these banking internships that lead to insanely profitable positions. And the kids that get these are always family members, always every time. And just the idea that we think you can really make something of yourself from nothing. If you work hard enough, it is such such a dishonest and frankly offensive line. Does it happen occasionally? Sure. Does it take 10 times the work? And do you oftentimes not get even 50% as far? Absolutely. And I really kind of don't, I don't know if this author, like, how much what I am associating with this storyline is purposeful. And if this author feels this way as well, or if it's just 
sort of accidentally lining up with the thoughts that I've been having about how this sort of thing works lately. But I have just started to really grow so frustrated at the the way that we lie to ourselves and to our children about how society works and about how everybody has the same opportunities and the same avenues open to them when that is absolutely not true. And the ways in which we often blame ourselves for not being more successful and wondering why we are behind some of our peers when the simple fact is our peers had access. And it's as simple as that. Um, so yeah, what's going on with Jai Long? Like his sister has simply been cut off from access. And like, if she had been healed and allowed to continue to study, who knows where she could be right now? I mean, he's on his way to trying to be an underlord at some point. He's hopeful about that. Maybe she could too. We don't know anything about what her level was like and what her abilities were. But they just decided to write her off due to her injuries because of, you know, the feeling like it wasn't worth it and the fact that she was partially responsible for him be, being a disgrace to the family. And I, I can't help but think, because of the way this society is structured, she probably blames herself for the two of them being disowned and banished, you know? It's not banished, banished, not really strictly, but it is really. Like, in... in all the, the ways that matter. And I could definitely see feeling personally responsible for the fact that your brother sacrificed everything on your behalf and, and really not feeling that you were worth it, that it was worth it. And that breaks my heart to think that she might feel that way. We don't get a ton from her because of the nature of their visit. When Jailon goes to see her, it's to inform her about how Kral was killed. And he tries to like, there's a sense I get that maybe she was kind of into Kral. I can't tell whether or not it's just a, a sisterly sort of like, oh, I really liked him. That's just a shame. It feels like there was more to it than that. Um, but I don't think that we get any sort of confirmation. But he tries to emphasize that the iron f like hit crawl from behind that it was like a cowardly act something without honor and that crawl's loss is not due to his own failing it was due to the fact that somebody else was willing to fight dirty but what's so sort of amusing about that is that b we know if crawl had taken Lyndon at all seriously he would have sensed Lyndon behind him you know we find out a lot that like jades and low golds they have basically they've got like spidey senses they feel the presence of people coming at them and he's the, like Jai Long is attempting to sort of preserve his friend's memory for his sister's sake but he knows that Crawl fucked up and I think that's part of why he's so angry is that it's not as simple as, oh, Lyndon fought dishonorably. It's Lyndon took advantage of the fact that Crawl was being really like arrogant in this moment and not taking this as seriously as he should have. And that was his fault. And that's never said. He never says that. But I think that's really like at the heart of why he's so upset is Crawl should have been able to get out of this. So he has to blame somebody and he's not going to lay it at the feet of his dead friend because that feels like, you know, it's feels disloyal despite the fact that it's true. And we get this amazing scene later that I genuinely teared up while I was reading. Jai Long is expecting that Crawl's father is going to be super pissed at him personally. He's just waiting for this dude to 
blame him for this this kid's death. Uh, essentially, I think that he is afraid that they are going to to lay the blame at his feet because of him being the one that like headed the group going into the pyramid that he was the one that like spearheaded that whole effort pun intended <laughs> um and so he thinks that everyone's going to look at him as being the one that is responsible for Carl's death and instead uh what's his name Gokran that's right i'm going to find this uh this moment here but um he Jai Long let the door slide shut behind him, unaccountably disturbed. Gokran had collapsed on the floor like a child, sobbing. He gripped his head in both hands, nails driven into his scalp. His reptilian gold sign let out a long, crooning cry. Somehow, Jai Long had pictured a man of Gokran's power and dignity standing over his son's body with arms folded demanding recompense from those responsible. Maybe a single tear would roll down his face, or his commanding voice would catch for an instant as a brief acknowledgement of human grief. He had never expected Gokrin to weep as though an enemy had torn out his own heart. I love this so much. The Sand Vipers have been seen by Jai Long this whole time as sort of an embarrassment, I think. He's taking full advantage of the position he has with them while he can. He acknowledges that they have their uses. But this is the first time you get the sense that that he has really seen how they may have a bit of a leg up on the Jai clan. It, it's not in terms of power, but there is a sense of family that is far beyond the usefulness that people have, the, the upkeep of reputation for the sake of reputation. This man is genuinely devastated that his son is dead. And it is for the sake of his son's life and the fact that he loved him. It's not the way that Jai Long, I believe, sees his family responding, which is, it's a shame that he died because our hopes rested on him for the future. I guess we have to start from scratch now. This is a real inconvenience. What a bummer. This is, I value this person as my son, a human being, someone with potential whom I loved and watched grow and cared about. And he's gone. And I didn't even get to say goodbye. It happened while I was away, which is particularly awful. And Jai Long is waiting this whole time for Gokran to turn to him and like literally bracing himself for like an attack, thinking, oh, this motherfucker is going to be so mad at me. And it doesn't come. Gokran turns to him and just tells him, you need to tell me what happened. And... Then let's see. I'm trying to find the spot. Um, let's see. I, when I fought his disciple, he distracted Crawl so that an iron child could stab him in the back. We believe it was developed by the Fisher Soul Smiths, but an Underlord could have any number of tricks. I would have killed him if the Underlord hadn't revealed himself. It sounded like an excuse, but it was only the truth. But he has no affection for the iron. He allowed me to take a prize from the ruins and he gave me a year. At the end of that time, I will meet his iron in a duel, and he will not interfere. So, what I particularly like is that Gokran simply says, I know you will avenge him. In a year, you will take back his honor, and I must only endure. I know you will not spend this time idly. What is your plan? So, the last book you know, we get the projections of what's going to happen and we get the uh, the insight into things and we see that Gokran is like, all right, I'm just going to leave it to Jai to, to Jai Long to avenge my son. And I said at the time, I don't see it. Like, I don't see him just relying simply on Jai Long. 
But it turns out he is aware of his own limitations. He seems to know, like he's going to help as much as he can, but he seems to know when it comes down to it, Jai Long was there when this happened and was sort of robbed of his getting to take vengeance on behalf of his friend because of the presence of an Aurelius. And I think that he thinks there's a there's a certain um, balancing of the scales that will happen if Jai Long is the one. And also, I think he realizes that Jai Long is simply so much more advanced that the fight would be a little bit too close to even potentially if it were just him. But if they give Jai Long time, it's just going to be no contest. And he thinks this before he even finds out about the spear. And in a detail that I particularly love, Jai Long had been low key going to keep it to himself that he got the spear. And I guess he was just hoping that word of it wouldn't get back to him right away. Um, I mean, I guess he figured he would just go and use it before the news filtered down to Gokrin because maybe the death of his son would prevent people from trying to come at him with other information about this. But Jai Long, when he says, what is your plan? All of a sudden he realizes he doesn't have to fear this dude taking this away from him. That's not how this is going to work. So he goes ahead and just shows him the whole fucking deal. And you know, explains this shit takes Madra from people and infuses me with it. And Gokrin's like, so you're going after your family, huh? And Chai Long doesn't answer him. It's very clear that that's what the fuck is going to happen. Will Jai Daishu stop you? The Underlord Patriarch of the Jai clan was a legend. With his own hands, he had built the Jai from a remote clan in the wilderness to an imperial power. If he acted, Jai Long's dreams of revenge would melt like snow in the summer sun. To him, propriety is the highest virtue. Every step must be taken in its proper order, and he will defend that order to the death. He will not act until his high golds, true golds, elites, and elders have all fallen. By the time Jai Daishi reveals himself, I will be more than his match. And Gokrin's like, you might, but you might not. There is a big difference between gold and underlord. And he says, it requires a certain insight that I've never gained. He flexed his hand into a claw. If it was only a matter of power, I would have broken through long ago. That is extremely interesting to me. Because obviously, whatever that insight is, Aethon has it. What is it? Is it is it to a degree just sort of letting go? Because there's a a whimsy to Aethon that doesn't even feel put on. There's a sort of disconnect that he has where it's like he's looking at the world like a game and isn't seemingly as invested as other people are. And I can't help but wonder if that's part of it. It's just like letting go. But um, so he says to Jai Long, I've heard that the Underlord is dying anyway. Is that true? And Jai Long's instinct is to just be like, I'm not going to tell you this is some private family shit. And then he realizes that he's doing that, that he's protecting his family, despite the fact that they could not give fewer shits about him at this point. He's about to go kill them all anyway. And yet he still has this like perverse loyalty to them. And he just is so disgusted with himself. I may... That is some real shit, guys. He says how deep their poison sinks. And I love that. You just don't unlearn shit like that overnight. And you can know intellectually in every direction what the truth is. But you still have this knee-jerk reflexive reaction to things sometimes that flies in the face of everything that you know to be true. And it can be incredibly 
disappointing to see that happen when you feel like you've made progress and really have left behind feeling loyalty to a certain group or cause or, you know, just in general. I really, really liked this moment. Um, so he says, unless they've discovered a miracle cure, he won't live five more years. Um, so Gokran says, you have only to avoid him for one. By the time you kill the iron, you'll have gutted the Jai clan. Then you retreat west back here and will hide you until the Underlord dies. Jai Long searched for words, but none came. At best, he had expected the Sand Viper chief to berate him for leaving. He'd even come prepared for a fight. He never dared hope that Gokran would break a long-standing alliance for him. He was tempted to tell the grieving father to reconsider that he was risking the future of his sect for personal vengeance. But the truth was, Jai Long needed every ally he could get. And Gokran comes over to him and grabs his shoulders and looks into his eyes and says, You were a brother to my son. Your enemies are mine. And Jai Long gets teary-eyed. And this gets even more intense. They go outside. All of these sand vipers who were, who were there for this attack and are feeling personally shamed at the fact that Kral is dead are waiting. And again, Jai Long is like, they are going to be so mad at me. And Gokran goes out there and tells them that we are going to go hunt and march with Jai Long against his clan. And they all fucking roar in agreement and come over and like bow to him. And he just stands there in absolute shock as they like clap him on the back and cheer him on because he has never experienced this kind of support before. This killed me. This scene just killed me. Can I just tell you that? Like, <clears throat> this is the shit that gangs are made of. You know, there's, there's, I really don't think that people who have grown up with a supportive family can understand what it's like to genuinely believe that nobody has your back and that you have to do it all for yourself. And the feeling of finding people who not only accept you, but are willing to fucking go to bat for you, genuinely have your back in a way that means something when the chips are down. When you aren't used to having that, it feels almost like a dream, you know, and, you know, people talk about second families and the idea of being able to build your own family. And I have always felt that is more valid than actual family. You know, there's all these stories and I don't just mean fictional stories. There are, there are so many histories in which people just defended those who shared blood with them. And if we really looked at what would have happened if we supported and defended those who matter to us and whom we care about personally and who repaid that by caring about us and defending us instead of simply blindly adhering to whomever we happen to be related to due to an accident of birth I really wonder how different the world would look because th th to me there is something really like <sighs> entitled about how some people seem to believe that if your family, you get to expect certain types of support because you were born to the, and with Jai Long, that was certainly erased. I mean, the, his family did not have his back, despite the fact that they were still blood and he was still alive. But I'm talking about how, um, like, in, it, you hear about friends who their parents simply expect that if they, come into money, let's say, 
that they are going to share that with the rest of the family. And if they don't, that that is somehow considered to be like a betrayal or a really selfish act. You see that all the time. And it's, it's, there is to me, you haven't earned that just because you are related to somebody that doesn't mean that you simply get to expect things, especially when you are the elder of the person you are speaking to. It's like wanting to reap the rewards of simply the fact that this like person shares blood. It just, there is a selfishness to that, that I don't understand, but this sort of thing be feeling so alone and this crew of people not only do they have Jai Long's back, but they clearly feel about Crawl's death very acutely and passionately in a way that I can imagine he wishes his family had felt about him, about what happened to him. So they share this like motivation as well as wanting to help Jai Long and not holding him responsible for what happened to crawl, which he fully expected and obviously does sort of blame himself for. And I just, I don't know. I just found this so moving, like, and it made me really happy to think that in the previous book, Jai Long had clearly been looking at the sand vipers with some derision, you know, he saw them as pawns and tools that he could use to advance himself and make the best of a bad situation. He didn't see that they were particularly worthy. He saw that they were disorganized and lacking in discipline, but he was going to get this spear for himself and go and kill his family and get this power for himself. And it was really just that simple. And I really enjoy that this book begins with a reevaluation of that plan. He's still going to go and fulfill that plan, but it looks really different with all of these people at his back and with this new relationship that he is sort of seeing like spring up. And I can't help but think that he had been sort of planning in, we don't get a full look at what his overall intention was. We knew he wanted the spear and that he wanted to absorb all of this power. But I believe the end goal was going to be, I want all of this power to like sort of just take over for my own sake and prove them all wrong. And now I wouldn't be surprised if he really decides to like take the sand vipers with him all the way and be part of their community instead of going it completely alone once he powers up. It's going to be, it's just going to have a totally different energy now, you know? Um, so anyway, I just, I am, I'm really into this sort of change of heart um, with a new family at his side. Jai Long marched to destroy his old one. I cannot tell you guys how like hype I was when we finished that section. Oh, I loved it so much. Um, so, okay. Let's then go to Lyndon. Um, Lyndon is learning. This is kind of like it. I, I get the impression from Ethan that this is a little bit, easier than what he really wants Lyndon to go through. You get this, the vibe that Ethan kind of wanted Lyndon to, <laughs> to experience like nonstop what he went through in the pyramid, you know, but he does seem to realize that's a little bit too much to ask. There's just a, a feel to the joking that he does wish it were possible. He wants Lyndon to advance as quickly as he can. Um, so let's see, but, 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 okay. Yeah. So we have him, uh, with Fisher Gesha. I wasn't sure to be honest that they were going to stay here. I kind of thought because of the way the last book ended that when we began this book, Lyndon would either be on the road or he would be arriving at the black flame empire. 
And I'm kind of glad we aren't there because I, I didn't feel done with Fisher Gesha. I'm glad she's still around. I was disappointed in the way that she was like willing to put down and pick up Lyndon, depending on what she needed. But it does make its own kind of sense. It's just, I wanted her to care about him no matter what and to have a heart that would stand up either way. And she doesn't. But it's important to know that about her, you know. And I don't, I would like if they travel to the Black Flame Empire, I would like to see it. I would like to to get a feel of what the countryside is like that they're traveling through. I wouldn't want to just start having arrived there with maybe a brief description of the places he'd seen on the way. Who knows how it winds up? I might wind up getting that later. But as of right now, we are still in the camp and we hear that the fishers have their borders like really locked down because they are aware that somebody might try to get up in here and get at Linden, whether or not there is like that year long agreement, you know, so there. And, and I think also it's like, it's not because, oh, we can't, we've got to protect Linden. They are worried about that because they know how fucking angry Ethan will be if anything happens to Lyndon. It is not for Lyndon's sake. It's for their own asses. They are covering their own asses because Ethan terrifies them. And we get a little bit more of a look at Ethan's relationship with his family later. We'll get there. But I don't know what to make of it. Um... So Lyndon is taking apart a dread beast and he is going in there to uh, get this binding out of there. Um, let's see. But he withdrew his hand most of the way, holding open the incision. Uh, Fisher Gesha says in a remnant, the binding would be easier to remove. No muscle to cut through. Simple, simple, simple to remove. But dread beasts keep their souls in their bodies, nasty little things. So they leave no remnants. Their techniques grow in them like this, alongside their organs. She was trying to cram as many lessons into him as she could before Ethan took him away, so that, so that the Underlord couldn't say she'd been neglecting his education. While Lyndon appreciated the effort, it was something of a distraction to have to listen when he was trying to remove a delicate piece of forged madra from a corpse. Um, so he gets a grip on this binding with the tongs and uh, he slid two fingers back into the dread beast next to the trapped binding. He pinched a bundle of slick muscle. And cycling Madra to enforce his fingers, he tore it away from the binding. It was like pulling apart warm bread. After he had ripped free every connection and tilted his tongs a few degrees, he gradually slid the binding out. It was a ball of jagged spikes, and yellow, the yellow of its material vis barely visible beneath the blood and bits of tissue. Um, and he's looking at it like, this must have really hurt. He dropped the blood-soaked binding onto a tray that Fisher Gesha had prepared for the purpose. Then something caught his eye. He turned back to the wolf's body, inserting the tongs once again. There was a glimmer of something behind the wet space where the binding had once rested, a speck of white too bright and clean to be bone. He pushed some of the muscle away, though he found himself leaning at an awkward angle to get around the ribs. The white object was a tiny spiral, no bigger than his thumbnail, but it was warped out of shape like a half-melted wax seashell. The white was speckled with a rainbow of other colors and, of course, drenched in blood, but he reached the tongs in for it. At first touch, the binding dissolved like chalk in rain. Fisher Gesha smacked him on the side of the head. So, evidently, this was Madra. And she's very mad at him for going to touch Madra that he doesn't know anything about. He thinks that this is the same shit that he found in the pyramid that they were using to build the spear. And is very excited, like, oh, here's some rare shit. And she's like, you idiot. I have seen a thousand of those. What are you fucking talking about? And he's like, well why can't we build a new spear out of it? And she's like, 
Oh, why don't we build a new spirit? Yeah, get fucking idiot. You think we haven't thought of that? Shut up. You're not smart. You haven't thought of a thing that none of us have thought of before. You're, you're fucking new to this. We're not. Stop acting like you're coming in here with these new ideas. And honestly, I fucking love this so much because there is such a trope of like some noob showing up to this like crew of olds and being able to be like, well, how about we do it this way? And showing them their business and all the olds being like, well, we never thought to do it that way. And while there is some truth to the fact that people get too set in their ways and they fail to have imagination after a while, they take it for granted that things have to be done a certain way simply because they've always been done that way. And, you know, mixing it up is beneficial and there are reasons to do that. I get all of that. And it is very tempting to just be like, oh, they came in and shook it up. You know, they're disrupting the Madra industry. But... It rarely happens like that. It's very rare that somebody new comes in with a genuinely new idea. It just, people have been doing this shit and trying a lot of experimentation and whatever. It's how long has Gesha been alive? Do we get, and I may not be privy to this information yet. So if it's a spoiler, nobody tell me, but do we know Does leveling up to iron, to low gold, change the duration of your life? I assume it does. Because the Underlord for the Jai clan is like, I think, a couple hundred years old, right? And I assume that if your body is literally hardened and changed physically by leveling up, that has to have an effect on your overall life expectancy. Um, so Gesha, I mean, if we're looking at a woman who is around her age, which I was putting mentally at like 65, 70, just in 70 years versus Lyndon's what, like 16, 17 years, she's going to have so much more experience. But if we look at it from maybe she's like way older than that, the value of what she knows I just need Lyndon to respect that a little bit more and not insult her with this idea that he came in here with this whole new concept that's like a fast track to doing a thing. And that's really overall her problem with Lyndon in this section is that he keeps on wanting to skip ahead. And in his defense, he has managed to do that a couple times now. So to a degree, the expectation that he has of being able to skip ahead has precedence. And there's not a lot you can tell to a person who has managed to pull that kind of shit off more than once. It's hard to convince them that they're not going to be able to just do that again. And honestly, the way I see, Oh, thank you, Andy. Andy says, yeah, leveling up does change your lifespan. Okay, cool. Um, what I see happening with Lyndon here and the fact that he has managed to level up a few times now when he was sort of told his whole life that was going to be next to impossible. Lyndon is experiencing this thing that I think a lot of us who were in like gifted and talented programs can relate to where we advanced so quickly as children ahead of the class in our reading comprehension or ahead of the class in the levels that we were able to perform in math. Um, And you get to thinking that in general, life is going to be easier for you because you seem to catch on to things more quickly and better than your peers. Failing to understand that being in the real world What you can do in a classroom doesn't matter. It's not that it doesn't translate at all, because frequently doing well in a classroom does translate to having a greater attention span, more comprehension, which can mean greater ability and advancement in the workforce. It can, but by no means is it guaranteed. And I think a lot of us advanced quickly in school 
expecting life to be the same way that once we left college and began to try and work for a living, that we would be able to get these promotions, that our work would be constantly recognized as being superior to our coworkers. And it was a really rude awakening to find out that's not how it happens almost ever. I mean, simply being appreciated by your superiors for doing work well is rare enough. The idea that you get recognized and are rewarded with commensurate raises or promotions is even more rare. Oftentimes, you do a great job and what you get is more work, not more money, just more work. So I feel like Gesh is trying to get that through to Lyndon that like, I know that you have managed to pull some shit off. That's not how it's going to always work. And you can't keep looking ahead 10 steps. It's there. That's no way to live. And you're not going to learn anything. You're going to fuck up in the present because you are so focused. And, and this is a genuine like what I, I was reading a study just the other day, actually, about how being super goal oriented can actually be a detriment to performance that if you are constantly focused on this distant goal, it will make you feel like your work in the present doesn't have much of an impact when in fact your work in the present is literally the only thing that matters at this moment because that is going to be one of the drops in the bucket. But when you just have your eye on this distant goal, you have no real connection to the work that's about to go into getting you there. So this is why, like, you know, if we're talking about a goal as being like weight loss and we're thinking, oh, I would like to lose 30 pounds. If you're constantly thinking about the number 30, you look at this like waffle cone full of ice cream and you're like, oh, 30 pounds is so far away. This choice here really isn't going to make that big a difference in the grand scheme But it will, though, because those little choices are the whole thing. Those choices are what make up the fabric of the goal once you get there. And you can't just skip them and expect to ever get there. So Lyndon has managed to jump ahead a few times. But everybody keeps on trying to remind him, like, yeah, from wood to copper and copper to iron is a whole fucking different animal than trying to get from jade to gold or from gold to true gold. You know, that's just, it's not the same. But he's gotten a little bit spoiled, just a little bit, and is starting to think that it's all going to be this simple. And I think he's in for a rude awakening on this. Um, Also, I love the fact that she's like, we can't, like, do you think that we haven't tried to make the spear? And he says, I have the notes from the ones who made the spear. And she's like, oh, you mean these? And she pulls them out and is like, yeah, you uh, might want to be more careful with these because they were just sitting around. And she's like, they are brilliant and they will provide you with years of study. But first you must learn the basics. And he tries to be like, well, I was I was going to try and do something with those notes. And she's like, oh, I'm I'm sure you were going to try and do something because you're a fucking moron. That is not how this works. And you absolutely cannot be trusted to experiment with what's in these notes. You don't even know how to walk yet. And you're out here trying to, you know, do a triathlon. Not happening, kid. And he's so irritated. But honestly, I really feel like she's got a point. It's so tempting to think like she's just trying to keep those notes away from him. And maybe she is. I don't know how common the, the she says they're brilliant notes. I'm going to assume she's, you know, going to use them herself. It's not like he's the only one who's got the, uh, the knowledge. And that will sort of amp up the contest potentially of maybe her trying to make one too. I don't know how much she cares about that spear, you know? Um, also, I think it's really interesting That this binding that pulls Madra, which he seems to have found inside this beast 
and also found inside the, the pyramid, it's, it is described as looking really similar. I don't know if it's absolutely the same as the one that he stole from the pyramid. But if it turns out it's that common and it hap- like it's that easy to find, that's going to be a bit of a blow. I'm hoping it's not exactly the same as the one he just saw. But it might be. So I guess we'll have to see. Um, so let's see. Um, given that most of the nearby trees were at least spotted with black corruption, if not entirely black, and the wildlife seemed to share the affliction, Linden could see why pure water might be a valuable enough commodity to support a powerful school of the sacred arts. Um, so we get a little bit of detail about this, uh, particular clan that focuses on water and the power that they have managed to amass with this. And he is trying to sort of joke around with Fisher Gesha at one point about how, uh, he's going to like tell Ethan about her not letting him do things himself and she takes that really seriously. He's intending it to be a bit of like a, eh, what if I told him this, huh? And she looks at him and is like, oh, word, are you trying to fucking threaten me right now? Because I will tell you what, I am not going to help you at all anymore. And he has to deeply apologize and reassure her more than once that he isn't going to go be a tattletale. Because it's really clear that she is not amused. Ethan is really scary to her in a way that he isn't to Lyndon, but kind of should be more. Lyndon, you know, Ethan's on his side. And when somebody scary is on your side, it's much easier to be amused by the fact that everybody else is so terrified. I think it's going to, there's going to have to be something that happens that will really hammer home to Lyndon maybe Ethan isn't as much on his side as it seems, but I don't know. Lyndon's so prepared to not think anybody's on his side. If he doesn't push himself, maybe it wouldn't have that much of an impact impact on him after all. Like he really seems ready for people to abandon him or, you know, kind of see him as a waste. So maybe I'm not giving him credit. I don't know. Um, also, I really like the fact that, uh, Geisha has this book called soul smithing for coppers and it's got all of these like little kids illustrations inside and Lyndon feels a way about it because it's just this reminder of how low level the work he's doing now is seen to be by everybody else that literally children are supposed to be doing this. But to a point that's just too bad. You got to you got to suck it up, cupcake. You got to set your pride aside and do what needs doing. Um, so we see him like uh, fusing things together and doing all of this work. And it's really like interesting. I only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm not going to get into it too much. But I really liked reading about the forging and the ways in which things combine um, and how they can be used for weapons. So let's go to uh, chapter three. Ethan is with Lyndon, bringing him to this barn that looks a lot like Gesha's barn, as it turns out, that he has built for Lyndon to train in. And he's got these sort of like practice dummies that light up. And the, the thing is, that when they light, you're supposed to hit them exactly as they're lit. They will stay lit. And... Once you've got them all lit in every part, head, arms, torso, that means that you won. And Yaren goes through this gauntlet in the way it is intended by fighting all of these things. It takes her, I think he says, 15 seconds, which uh, Lyndon's watching her do it. And it's just kind of like, good God, this bitch is so good. Like... Lyndon is clearly so impressed with her all the time. And I just love how much he admires her. It's so pure. Um, So Lyndon, for his part, uh, like, you know, they're talking about how this all 
like how she managed to beat it and the timing of it and how much time Ethan has for like it's his is a two second long course. Um, but Lyndon goes up and he says, let me clarify, as long as I light up the circles on a dummy, I have defeated the enemy. Just so. Lyndon nodded. Then he reached a hand out over the controls and sent Mandra flowing into a command circle. So he lights up all of them from the podium and then is like, victory, boom, five seconds. And Yaren is like, what the fuck? That's not the right way to do this. And Aurelius, I say Aurelius, Ethan is like, hmm, isn't it? I mean, he accomplished it. Why do you think your way is better than his way? Why is it? And Yaren's basically like, no matter what, you are eventually going to come up against somebody that you can't trick your way out of. Power is going to be the thing in the end, really. And I like that there's not a she's right and you're wrong. He's right and she's wrong. Basically, Athens like she has a point. You both have a point. You're both part of the way there. You have to take advantage of every single little advantage you can. But also strength does matter. You can't pretend that isn't a factor at all. It's simply you have to learn how to combine the two so that it makes for the most lethal enemy. Um, and I just, I don't know. I really, really love her saying to, because Lyndon says, in my humble experience, you cannot wait until you are stronger than your opponent to fight. Sometimes the game is rigged against you and your only option is to flip the board. Yaren gave him a blank stare. You're my prime example. You saw you couldn't make it six feet in this world without a gold sign, but your clan wouldn't let you train. What did you do? You walked right off. You've been fighting against stronger opponents since the day I met you, rigged game or no. And he's looking at her and he's like, huh, I, that's kind of true. And he can't get himself to fully agree, but I just really like this moment. So Ethan's ruffling their hair and he keeps saying, well, somebody's about to, uh, to come join us. Hold on a sec. And this dude comes in blonde hair looks very similar to Ethan. He calls him his brother, but this dude is like, I'm not his brother. He's like a uh, cousin. And he's like, mm, not cousins either. And Ethan's like, no, nah, we're like brothers. And there's this sort of sense to the way that Ethan's talking to this guy, whose name is Cassius, by the way, he is in charge and Cassius is irritated i think a little bit by how cavalier he is about things and seems to tolerate him more than really agree with him or believe in him um and i don't know there's just something about the whole way this goes down cassius says something about how they're going to give linden some protection when he goes to his family and uh, or, like Ethan has to be like, oh, no, 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 he's not going ho home. He's coming with us. I've adopted them. And Cassius is like, oh, OK, with this sort of like this fucking guy again, picking up strays. There's just this feel to it of like, I've been here before and this guy is really trying my patience and I'm starting to get irritated by it. And I want to know more about that. So much more. So bad. Um, so then they talk about like what's going up with the Jai clan. Uh, the, they have seized the Aurelius's assets. Um, he says, we've lost the flame garden, three warehouses, the sword hall, two of our medical contractors. Each time they claim they're settling a private debt. They've sabotaged two major sanitation projects that I'm aware of, and eight full crews have vanished. We don't know if they were bribed away or silenced. Um, so they are uh, talking about, like, you know, 
<laughs> Linden, they're talking about a bunch of families. The Kotai clan is one that comes up. Um, the Naru, who we heard about in the first chapter. And both uh, Linden and Yaren are kind of like, I don't know what the f- fuck are they talking about? Like, they're just so left out of the conversation. And then Cassius is like, oh, okay, BT dubs. Um, to get back to people that you know, the Jai clan was trying to prevent me from returning with the Underlord. Uh, they've made life difficult. If the Jai warriors down below hadn't called for help, I would not have been able to land. Called for help? Yaren asked. What's got their feathers rustled? I was too high up to see clearly, but it's strange. It seems they were attacked by one of their own. And that is where the chapter ends. And I was just like, God damn it. I almost decided to err on more pages and read the next chapter, but I always go over time. So I'm just trying to do 50 pages or less and never do more because I just clearly can't be trusted and handle that shit. So, um, so yeah, I'm super excited to read more and talk about it tomorrow. Yay. Uh, all right. Well, thank you guys again so much for listening. Thank you to Andrew for commissioning the episode. Andy, um, really, really appreciate it and appreciate you always being here to help me out in the chat. And I will see you tomorrow with the next episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.